Bibles. If you accept the idea the First Amendment is at its core designed to speak truth about the government, designed to speak truth, designed to protest, designed to, to give a redress of grievances, the government is the one saying you can't use any money to express exactly this at exactly the time it's most relevant when we're about to have an election because money. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Special thanks to Joshua Davis from Tandapay for sponsoring this video's topic. Learn more at tandapay.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. Today I am doing a guest spot for Leonard French's channel and with me is Tactical Bra. Say hello, Tactical. Hello. What we are going to do today is cover the First Amendment as it relates to speech, particularly as it relates to political speech. We are going to cover three cases of note that cover this, finishing, of course, with the notable case of Citizens United, which is a major case, which, at least in my opinion, is somewhat misunderstood as it relates to the public. So first, we're going to start with Buckley v. Vallejo, and then we're going to discuss some other cases. So let's get started with that. So as a Canadian, I have not heard of Buckley v. Vallejo. So, That's okay. It's not as particularly well known. It's a foundational case in this area, but it's not particularly well known. So first, we are going to read the Supreme Court's opinion from 1975 case of Buckley v. Vallejo. And give us an importance, I think we'll read the entire thing. Now, it's a short 294 pages. So... <laughs> I think maybe we won't do that after all, and we will just read the abstract. It is notable for being perhaps the longest opinion the Supreme Court has ever written. However, I do think there is one paragraph in particular that is notable, so we'll skip to that paragraph because I think it highlights the issue. So while in this opinion there are obviously many notable things of importance, at least in my opinion, this paragraph on page 19 summarizes the philosophy of the case very well, so I will read this paragraph in full so that we can hear what the court is trying to say. It says, a restriction on the amount of money a person or group can spend on political communications during a campaign necessarily reduces the quantity of expression by restricting the number of issues discussed, the depth of their exploration, and the size of the audience reached. This is because virtually every means of communicating ideas in today's mass society requires the expenditure of money. The distribution of the humblest handbill or leaflet entails printing, paper, and circulation costs. Speeches and rallies necessitate hiring a hall and publicizing the event. The electorate's increasing dependence on television, radio, and other mass media for news and information has made these expensive modes of communication indispensable instruments of effective political speech. So for me, the first takeaway lesson here is that not that money is speech, because I think that that's a misstatement by people in general. It's a misstatement to say money is speech. Rather, it is much more correct to say that money facilitates speech. And this is tr as true today as it was in 1790. Obviously, the types of speech that were available in 1790 and how much they cost are much different than as in now. But the idea of money facilitating speech is just as true as is now. In fact, in 1790, some of those modes of speech were much more expensive. For example, printing pamphlets was much more expensive because the technology at the time and the paper used was much more expensive than now. And distribution of those pamphlets was much more expensive. There was no way to transport those pamphlets from town to town except through a horse cart and other sort of slow means. So the idea of transporting things was more expensive relative to modern means. So even in 1790, the idea of money being used to facilitate speech is still true. You know, you have to print the handbills. You have to get them distributed. If you're going to run a newspaper, you have to print the newspaper. Someone has to buy the ink. Someone has to stand on a street corner and hawk the newspaper. You're going to have to pay that person one way or another. There has to be some method of distributing. So in 1790, as in today, if you want to stand on the proverbial soapbox on the street corner, you can do that for free, but the power of your voice only goes as far as the people who happen to be walking by. Any other means of expression in 1790 or today requires the expenditure of money. So whether that's 1790s printing uh, of pamphlets or printing newspapers or printing journals or other things of that distributing, or whether it's the modern day equivalent of buying ads on Facebook, the underlying philosophy is still the same. Without money, 
you cannot have speech. We don't have to restrict your ideas to restrict speech. We can simply restrict your money. Because if we say you can say whatever you want, but you can't spend any money to do it, then your message is just as silenced as if it was never being able to heard in the first place. Now, you're talking about 1790. Is that when the Constitution was written? 1789, or? to be precise, but I rounded up. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we look to the date of the First Amendment to understand what these terms were meant, at least from a conservative perspective. So we talk about the freedom of speech, the First Amendment protects. It's the pre-existing freedom of speech. The word the indicates a pre-existing antecedent. So we're looking to the understanding of freedom of speech and what did that entail in 1790. So in 1790, it encompassed the ability to hand out, um, hand it out bills in terms of pamphlets or other sort of written materials. That's true today and it was true now. And so the underlying philosophy is as true now. It's just that the technological means are a little bit different, but the philosophical view is the same now as in 1790. If Facebook had existed in 1790, basically the results should come out exactly the same. So far, I can't find anything to argue against as, as the resident lefty Canadian. <laughs> Well, let me ask you from a Canadian perspective, since you have different election rules. Of course, you also have a different election period. So remind me again, how long does the Canadian election period run where people are actually actively campaigning for office? Uh, it can vary a little bit because we don't have set dates for our election. Um, typically, six weeks would be a good election period where you dissolve parliament and then six weeks later, there's an election and past six weeks, Canadians really start losing our patience. We're like, okay, we've talked about politics enough now, get back to running the country. And we don't want to hear about the leaders anymore. Okay, well, fair enough. So for the six week period, then the logic would seem to hold, you know, we want to communicate to uh, how many citizens are there roughly in Canada? I wanna say like 33 million, but I'm probably off by a few million. That's fine. So let's say it's 35 million rounding up. So there's 35 million communication Canadians we potentially want to communicate to. We want to get our message out. We ideally probably would want to communicate them to them more than once and more than one channel of communication because we don't know whether or not they're listening to radio or watching TV or reading a newspaper or Facebook or whatever other sort of abilities there might be for Canadian media. Um, so obviously, it seems to me every part of that might require money. Now, some of that is somewhat free, but not totally free. You know, you could say you can upload a video on YouTube, but even that requires the expenditure of money, the cost of the mic, the cost of production staff, you know, the cost of people to put it together, the cost of developing a campaign ad, someone to write the ad, someone to do the music for the ad maybe, uh, or licensing of music rights, as we've discussed in copyright many, many times. Um, we want to d get out many dif different messages because we have many different issues we want to campaign on. So let me ask you as a Canadian, because you and your country have a limit on the amount of money, what do you think that does in terms of the ability of the candidates to effectively communicate their speech? I think they have to be smart about uh, what they want to spend their money on. Um, they also have to be creative about how to get free advertising and how to um, encourage newspapers and media to cover what they have to say. And as a potential uh, challenger, if I were running for uh, office as a challenger, because let's assume it's me, I have no recognition in Canada, but let's assume I have really good ideas. How was I, as a challenger, supposed to compete, you know, if I can't put my name out there and stuff like that? How, how am I supposed to really communicate my message effectively to my fellow Canadians? Well, you would have to raise money before um, you could spend money. Well, let's assume that's not an issue. Let's assume I have as much money as the law will allow me to spend. There, there are some kind of sneaky ways that you can try to get advertising. So say, like you release a book around the same time that you could be talking about the book to media, uh, but really it's also getting your name out there and, and right. becoming more visible. Uh, so there are things that are, that are kind of borderline. Does it actually count as election 
uh, speech or does it count as talking about uh, just uh, issues that are big during the election? Well, so, that's, a like, real, that's a really good point. Once you start trying to define what is and is not political speech, it becomes a problem. I was reading an article on this recently that I'm thinking about covering in a different video where it's saying, well, you know, Twitter says they don't want to have any political ads. Sounds real great right up until the moment you have to define what's a political ad. And, you know, because it's like what counts and what doesn't count as a political ad. And so you, you've pointed out some of the subterfuge. So, you know, it comes it becomes an issue of how can you circumvent the rules? You know, so maybe the rules aren't as effective as you might want them to be because, you know, you have you have this problem. You know, if you put out an issue ad, is that is that a campaign ad? If I just put out an ad saying my name is Kurt Mueller and I think parks are great. Is that a political campaign or not? If that's a central part of my platform, you know, more national parks or whatever. So, you know, these are the kind of problems you have. But if you can have the restriction on money, you effectively restricted the underlying speech. And I think Canadians can see that in terms of what they're doing because of the subterfuge around it. At least in the United States, we saw that problem by just saying spend the money directly anyway. You know, if you want, if you want to send a pamphlet to every single person in the United States by mail, it's going to cost you a fortune to do that. But if it's that important for your campaign, you can send out 300 million pieces of mail in the U.S. Postal Service and go right to every person's door directly as part of your method of getting your speech out. You know, you could you could hand deliver your copy of your latest book to every single person in the United States if you were so inclined, you know, if you could get the staff together. But it's the ability because once the government sets a limit on speech, you know, it, it, it becomes a thing that they can use to help further their own incumbency if they're so inclined, because, you know, the system tends to favor the incumbent anyway because their name is well known. So they have incentives to manipulate the dollar value in such a way as is going to prevent them from losing office. So there's a lot of downsides to that um, because of those issues. I know that it's an issue for charities because a lot of charities, as part of their tax exempt status, are not supposed to engage in, in political support of stuff. So you can talk about the issues, but not necessarily individuals. So, for example, you know, Planned Parenthood, um, they might say, here's where each party stands in terms of the rights that we're known for talking about but they wouldn't be able to endorse a particular candidate. So there there are some fun rules about, you know, how close can you get to the line before yeah. it counts as endorsement. Which in the end, at least to my mind, seems a little bit silly, but you know, that's where where you wind up. You know, it's like it's like, you know, not touching you kind of game. You know, I'm in the back of the car, not touching you, not touching you. It's like, you know, why not just get it over with and just uh, you know, let it be a free for all. But yeah, that's kind of the philosophical conundrum. So I thought next what we might do is we talk about the case that Citizens United most directly overruled. This is the case of Austin versus Michigan State, 1990. This is not good law anymore. Citizens United overruled this directly, but I thought it might have some value in seeing where Citizens United was trying to correct some things that they saw a problem. So Michigan had a law in its Campaign Finance Act known as Section 54, which prohibited corporations excluding media corporations, which runs into its own definitional problems that we do not have time for right now, from using general treasury funds for expenditures with a state candidate. However, they were able to have segregated funds. So basically what this said is, look, if you're a corporation and you want to spend money on a campaign, you can, you just can't spend it out as part of your general treasury. You have to raise money separately as part of a political action committee or the equivalent. And so that people who are contributing to that know that they're contributing to a political view. So most people who, for example, buy things from a corporation are not necessarily intending to express a political message. So the idea is, you know, if you want to give, you know, random co corporation money for the purpose of forwarding their political aspirations, that's legal. They can spend that money. But just because you bought a random product from them doesn't give them the right to spend general treasury mon money for political purposes. So that was what Michigan was trying to do in its section. This is interesting to me. So um, they wouldn't be able to use regular profits 
to be able to do political speech, they would have to separately raise funds in order to do political speech. Yes, essentially correct. And in, in a lot of senses, that might have some logic to it because, you know, it, just because you buy a product doesn't necessarily mean that you're supporting the political aspirations of the corporation, even if you can define what those are. Um, so it was an idea of, you know, letting people be on notice of what they were or were not supporting. You know, because I give you money doesn't necessarily mean I'm asking you to speak. You know, I can do that with my own money. I'm just trying to get a product, for example. So that's the logic of it. I can see why that was overruled. Well, let's read a little bit about the summary of this case to show what this what the Supreme Court at the time was saying. It says, although the 54-1 requirements burdened the chamber's exercise, this is Chamber of Commerce, they are justified by compelling state interest. And then it goes on to say it's sufficiently narrowly tailored, which is a strict scrutiny standard, to achieve its goal because it's precisely targeted to eliminate the distortion caused by corporate spending while also allowing corporations to express their political views by making expenditures through separate segregated funds. Because persons who contribute to segregated funds understand their money will be used for the political purpose, their speech accurately reflects the contributor's support for the corporation's political views. That's a a little bit interesting to me, the idea that um, a consumer can control, in a sense, what the company is allowed to do with the money after the company has earned it. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if I if I as a person were spending my own money, you know, if you bought something for me that I personally was selling, you know, it's my money, I should be able to spend it whatever way I want. And so the logic there would seem to hold. But this was something Michigan was trying to do. And the Supreme Court at the time said that this was constitutional. Yeah, I believe it was a 6-3 decision. And, you know, it was controversial for the reasons that we've said. You know, there's there's the idea of sort of a hierarchy of speech in First Amendment law. You know, different kinds of speech come out differently. You know, at the very bottom of the constitutional tier is the unprotected speech. So this is your slander, libel, defamation, and other things of that kind. Then when the middle tier, we have commercial speech in the terms of advertising, advertising speech for a product. One of the big restrictions there because it's typically analyzed at intermediate scrutiny, middle level scrutiny, one of the big restrictions there is it has to be true. Um, So they can't make blatant falsehoods. You know, that's where the FTC and other um, actors get involved if people are misrepresenting their products and state authorities can get involved. You know, so you can say you can say statements that are puffery. You can say statements that are exaggerating. But if you make a statement that is intended to be understood as a factual representation of your product and it's false, That's a no-no. You can't do that because corporation speech in the terms of advertising is analyzed at that next tier. Then next up- So I can't do like half of the pizza places in New York that say that they're New York's number one pizza? Well, the wonderful thing about something like that is number one pizza with respect to what measurement? See, they leave it vague specifically for that reason. They don't say what it is. And even if they did, it's like saying world's best cup of coffee it's considered puffery. No one would take it as a literal statement of truth. So, you know, it's meant to be as an exaggeration to that no one is intended to, intending to believe as literal truth. So those are two things. First of all, if you say number one pizza, number one pizza with respect to what? Number one, pi- number one pizza with respect to the, what the owners of the pizza restaurant seem to think? I mean, obviously that's true. They seem to think it's the best pizza. So, you know, by leaving it open, it leaves an impression. And even if you took it as more literal, number one best in quality for example it's a puffery statement no one should no one's going to take it literally and anyone who does is a fool essentially so the the law does not protect you from being an idiot darn so there goes my get rich quick scheme of just you know sending a bunch of lawsuit threats to all the pizza places yeah exactly (sighs) silly laws and their logic next before turning to the decision in citizens united I thought I would pinpoint the moment where it all went horribly, horribly wrong for the government's argument. So there's a scene from The Simpsons in which Lisa Simpson is rejecting Ralph. And Bart Simpson pauses the tape and see you can actually see the moment where his heart breaks in half and goes through it one frame at a time until he gets to the moment when when his heart is breaking in half. And so when I read these this oral argument, this portion of the oral argument, If they weren't messed up before this, 
This is the part of the oral argument where it just went completely wrong for the government. And I think you're going to see why when we see what they say. So this section starts with Justice Alito. This is oral argument from 2008, the first time they had oral argument because they had oral argument on this case twice. Justice Alito says, do you think the Constitution required Congress to draw a line where it did, limiting this to broadcast cable and so forth, going to what mediums are protected? What is your answer to Mr. Olson's point? There isn't any constitutional difference between this distribution of the movie on video demand and providing access on the internet, providing DVDs, either through a commercial service or in a public library, providing the same thing in a book. So he's asking what, Congress in its law talked initially about broadcast and cable mediums. Okay, fine. But constitutionally, why is that important? What's constitutionally special about cable and broadcast from the First Amendment perspective as it relates to the, the message that's being spread? Because it's not about anything except the message, the content of the message. Because remember, under, before the law, you could have ads about literally anything else you want except political advertisement. This is only banning political advertisement, which is a little bit funny because political advertisement is no, or political speech is normally thought of as the most important. So, you know, anyone could talk about anything all day long as long as it wasn't politics. So that was a little bit suspect. Just by way of factual background here, the people in Citizens United, what they wanted to do was create a movie documentary about Hillary, Camp, Hillary Clinton, and they wanted to fund it themselves, produce it themselves. They wanted to distribute it to theaters using their own money and put it on paid, uh, paid um, on demand on cable. So they were, they were a bunch of citizens, as the name suggests. They were a bunch of people who didn't have that much money individually, but believed in the same thing. And they wanted to get their money together to collectively produce a midi movie, distribute a movie, and have it available. So that's what they were trying to do in Citizen United. And because, obviously, producing a movie, even one that's fairly bare bones, is going to run tens of thousands of dollars, you know, even for the most bare bone of bare bones movie, you know, the idea of restricting money to restrict speech becomes very important if you're trying to film a movie. And from a constitutional perspective, why is a movie more suspect than some other medium? So that's the question Alito is trying to ask. And right here at the bottom, he asks what is the most seminal question, providing the same thing in a book. Because anytime you're talking about books and restrictions on speech in books, bad omens are about to emerge. Let's see what happens. Mr. Stewart says, I think the Constitution would have permitted Congress to apply the electioneering communication restrictions to the extent they are otherwise constitutional under Wisconsin right to life. That's a prior case. These could have been applied to additional medium as well. Justice Alito. That's pretty incredible. You think that if a book was published, a campaign biography that was the functional equivalent of express advocacy, that could be banned? Question mark. Hmm, book banning sounds a little bit suspect. Ooh, yeah. Mr. Stewart, I'm not saying it could be banned. I'm saying Congress could prohibit the use of corporate treasury funds. Justice Alito, well, most publishers are corporations. Mr. Stewart, well, of course, the statute has its own media exemptions. Going to this idea that media organizations are somehow special. So they were exempt. Media organizations, whatever they are, they were exempt. So somehow media corporations are special. Justice Alito says, I'm not asking what the statute says. The government's position is the First Amendment allows the banning of a book if it's published by a corporation. Mr. Stewart, because the First Amendment refers to both freedom of speech and to the press, there would be a potential argument that media corporations would have greater First Amendment rights. Personally, I think that's wrong, but he makes that argument. Justice Kennedy. Well, suppose it were an advocacy organization that had a book, right? So we're going to say, okay, fine, media organizations are exempt. Let's consider the non-media organization case. Suppose it were an advocacy organization that had the book. Your position is that under the Constitution, the advertising for this book or the sale of the book itself could be prohibited within the 60, 90 day periods. Mr. Stewart, if the book contained functional equivalents of express advocacy, and that's where the case just completely falls apart 
because the government just argued that if a private corporation, that's not a media organization, but if a private corporation has a book that is expressly advocating for an advocate, the government can ban any sort of money for that book. So they can ban advertising for the book, they can ban the publication of that book, they can restrict access to the book. So we're talking about the government's ability to ban books. That's where this constitutionally is going, and that is the moment this all goes completely and falls apart. I understand why the why the Supreme Court ruled the way that they did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, anytime you're talking about book banning, that's that tends to get people's attention. And the problem is that he has to make that argument. Because to me, I can't think of a way to get past that argument. I can't think of one. Why why is cable or broadcast medium special when it comes to the First Amendment and the ability to speak a particular message. Because we're not talking about anything except the content of the message. We're talking about political advocacy. That's going directly to subject matter communication. So this is a ban on subject matter. And subject matter is normally subject to strict strict scrutiny. We want to ban political ads, expenditure of money on cable. Okay, why is cable special? Why can't the government ban it in every other place, including books? And the government has to say they can. There's no logical limiting principle. And I agree, there isn't a logical limiting principle. If you say it's okay to ban the subject matter over here, why not everywhere? And then suddenly we're banning books, we're banning newspapers, we're banning pamphlets, we're banning all the things. You know, We're banning anyone who's publishing anything that uses any kind of expenditure of money as it relates to specifically, mind you, specifically political speech. So again, you can communicate anything you want as long as it isn't political speech, even though political speech is normally considered the paramount speech value because we live in a republic. And as a republic, we the citizens collectively are in control of the government. And so it is in our interest to communicate to each other what we think. And we're specifically barred by the government from communicating exactly the most important thing, specifically at the most important time to communicate it, which is just before the election. So the logic of it just completely blows my mind because it makes no sense from basic First Amendment principles. If you accept the idea the First Amendment is at its core designed to speak truth about the government, designed to speak truth, designed to protest, designed to, to give a redress of grievances, the government is the one saying you can't use any money to express exactly this at exactly the time it's most relevant when we're about to have an election because money. If we can restrict money, we don't have to restrict your idea. You can say whatever you want. You can't just spend any money to do it. And that's exactly the same thing. So to me, from First Amendment principles, the idea of restricting the expenditure of money just completely blows my mind. I can't even get my head around it. It's like, is political speech not the most important kind of speech? Is it not the exact paramount value of the speech? I mean, we're not talking about like entertainment speech. We're not talking about like just a movie designed to entertain people. I mean, that's important in its own right. We're talking specifically about a movie that's designed to communicate political speech, a political idea just at the time it's most important, just before the election with that person who's running. And you want to restrict the expenditure of money so they can't put out their movie. They can't get out their message. They can't communicate the one they want to communicate. I mean, how insane is that from a First Amendment perspective? It makes absolutely no sense to me. And so from my framework, I think all the people who are against Citizens United don't understand the case. They don't understand what it is. All they hear is things like, oh, corporations are people and money is speech. First of all, Citizens United didn't decide corporations are people. The idea of corporate personhood goes as far back as the idea of corporations. The entire idea of the corporate form was to separate the person from the corporate form. So the corporation could do things without putting the individual at risk. So if you want to open your your shop, you can open your shop without putting your personal expenses on the line. The entire idea is to segregate your funds from the corporate funds to allow you the freedom and the ability to go forth and put forth a corporate risk without putting a personal risk. So the idea of the corporations are people goes as far back as the corporate form. And it's wrong in my view to say that money is speech. That's not what the case is saying. It's that money facilitates speech. That's directly Buckley v. Vallejo. 
It's that money gives you the ability to speak. If you can't spend money, you can't put you can't put together the movie. You can't buy the distribution channels. You can't put it in theaters. You can't put it available for sale, either on pay-per-view or other distributed mediums. It prohibits you from speaking exactly at the time you're supposed to speak. And so if someone can explain to me how restricting political speech just before the campaign by restricting money is a good idea in principle or compatible with the First Amendment. You're smarter than me because I can't figure it out. I'm reminded of something that Ken White, a.k.a. Popat on Twitter, said about restricting um, the First Amendment and that it is the people in power that decide how to enforce the laws. And so the people who are typically disempowered within the legal system or within society are usually the first and the hardest hit by new regulations or, or new legislation or anything like that. And so I'm thinking that if I was the governor in power and somebody was running attack ads against me, I might use a law like this to try to silence criticism of me. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely, Tactical. It's like all the people who want to, I know this is slightly a far field, but who want to ban hate speech or ban political speech. It's like the only way to do that, if you want to make it a crime, for example, is give the government the power. Okay, great. You, you just, in the immediate situation, you just gave Donald Trump, president of the United States, the power criminally to criminalize certain speech based on hate speech or political speech. Now, do you think that he, or any president for that matter, might in some way interpret the, the law in such a way as to benefit them politically? Do you think that's a thing that might happen? So yeah, we want I to give the government the power to him. do this? Are you out of your mind? Yeah, I, I, would, I would not trust him to regulate my speech. No. And, and what is and is not hate speech looks suspiciously like the things that are most against what you believe. So my view of hate speech probably differs quite a bit from your view of hate speech. We differ politically. And so things I find to be hateful probably don't align with things you believe be hate hateful. It's like, do you want to put me in power or do I want to put you in power? Who, who can we trust? Who decides this? And you really want to give, like, say, for example, the FCC or the FEC or any or the FTC you don't want to give any of those groups the power to decide what is and is not valid political speech really this is what you want to do this is a good idea lord have mercy well i i much better understand the arguments behind this now am i correct in understanding that super PACs, um largely came out of this decision that you could have groups of people come together, raise funds for the purpose of speech, political speech. Uh, and they didn't have, as long as they weren't officially a tie to a campaign, then they didn't have to follow necessarily all of the campaign finance laws. That's that's roughly correct. The idea, at least in principle, and how true it is in reality may be a separate thing, but the idea in principle is that it's an organization that is disconnected and not controlled by the campaign, so they're an independent expenditure, and they want to spend money expressing their political view, and so they express views you know, consistent with that. So that's where PACs and super PACs largely come out of Citizens United, because as we discussed from the Austin case, there had been these restrictions on this before, but this case said, okay, well, it's, it's the spending the money is the same as facilitating speech. And so we can't put a restriction on it. It doesn't make any sense. And I have to agree. It doesn't make sense. So yeah, this is where PACs and super PACs come from. Now, how independent those are and are not is a whole nother issue, but you know, should groups of people, I mean, the, the problem, the problem is it's like, do you want only Michael Bloomberg? or his kind of tier of people being able to speech speak. You know, you or me doesn't have the same amount of, of power, but maybe what we could do is we could collectively come together and so we could pull our money together and so we could speak as loud as Michael Bloomberg. 
Well, if there are rules against this pooling money, if there's rules against this putting together money into a corporate entity, which is nothing more than like a collection of people really at its core, so that we could get together and express our message at at least a comparable volume to something like the Koch brothers or Bloomberg or, you know, Soros or insert your other person of choice in this sentence, um, you know, we should have the ability to do that. And so you can give money you know, $5 or $10 or $20 or $100 at a time to, for example, the NRA or the ACLU or the Human Rights Campaign or insert your other charity of choice. Or if none of those suit you, you can create your own so that you and your people that belong to you, you know, your friends you use can get money together to put forward the views that you want. And the government doesn't have the ability to say, no, you can't pull money together. No, you can't spend money. No, you can't put forward your political views because that would only favor incumbencies. It would only favor the super rich. It would only favor the people who, you know, can get around these rules by circumventing the rules by by clever, you know, tactics of manipulation, as we were discussing, in, for example, in Canada, and that as the rich who always have the most ability to do that because they have the most the most advisors to help them figure out how to do it. And so it's like, do you really want to further entrench the powerful? Don't you want the ability of the little people to come together? You know, yeah, Michael Bloomberg can spend as much money as he wants, unlimited months, amounts of money, but so can everyone else. And it's the only way we can compete is by collecting together. And yeah, a group of citizens collected together can compete with someone like Michael Bloomberg. You know, it's possible and it happens. There are these there's these organizations that do this because of something like Citizens United. And to me, it goes to the core of what it means to speak politically. It's It just begins to make sense. And I particularly love it when they were exempting media organizations. Oh, that's a good idea. Let's exempt media organization. Let's Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, for example. So Jeff Bezos is exempt from this. He gets to spend all the money he wants because he controls a media organization, the Washington Post. Well, that seems like a really good idea. The super rich suddenly get to say whatever they want because they own media groups. And, you know, Michael Bloomberg owns Bloomberg Media. Wow, what coincidence. And maybe they want to support those same views. So Roger Ailes with Fox News. I mean, wow, suddenly Roger Ailes gets unlimited communication. But you or I don't get unlimited communication because we're not rich enough to own a media organization. I mean, the whole thing seems to only support the rich. This whole thing empowers the poor because they still can speak just as loudly as they ever could. They are, not, they are no more empowered than they were before. They're only more empowered with a case like Austin on the books. They have the exactly the same amount of power under Austin as they do under Citizens United because they have the exact same amount of money and the exact same ways to speak. But now with Citizens United, you or I at least have a chance to compete in the marketplace of ideas. And by pooling our money together, we can do so. And we can do so effectively. And because we saw how money can be used in, in ways, you know, in the Trump campaign, you know, just because you have more money doesn't mean that you win. You know, Trump was way, uh, Hillary Clinton way outspent Trump, but Trump still won because, you know, because he was able to get his message out and we can see the importance of being able to speak. I mean, can you imagine him not being able to speak or someone else did? I mean, it would change the entire thing so that the, the people who are empowered would already do it. To me, the, to me, from First Amendment principles, the idea of restricting the expenditure of money makes absolutely no sense. Philosophically, ethically, from a principle of equality, it makes no sense. You probably so I don't get shouldn't it. ask me if I want to take away Trump's ability to speak um probably use a different person but... yeah well you Sorry, know to i'm making to... a joke you're talking yeah, about i understand but you understand the problem to take away trump's rights and this is what elizabeth warren has been saying because someone asked elizabeth warren if if twitter should ban trump and she said no at least she gets it you know if you ban trump you can ban anybody you know so it's like where where do you draw the line who decides and i also wonder what counts as a media organization so if i have a blog is that a media i don't know i'm sure it was defined in the statute in really sort of interesting and creative ways which is one of my problems i have when people talk about freedom of the press belonging to media organizations i don't like that interpretation at all to me press is not media press is technology so you or i have exactly the same amount of freedom of press as cnn does I don't like the I don't like people who say, well, because media organizations are press, they're covered by freedom of press. To me, that's a fundamentally wrong argument. Media organizations are not press within the meaning of the First Amendment. That's not what press is talking about. 
is talking about the ability to communicate through different kinds of technology. So CNN has the ability to communicate through its technology. I have the same amount of ability to communicate through technology. CNN is not more special than me. The First Amendment belongs to the citizens individually. CNN is not part of the cool kids crew just because they, you know, think that they're a media organization, they're somehow press. I think that's just wrong. They're not press. You know, that's not what the freedom of press is about. It's about both, it's about the literal, it's about in its pure form, the literal access to the actual physical printing press. That's what it means by press, the physical machine. And by extension, access to technology to publish. So CNN and I both have access to the machine. We both can use the machine, whatever that is, whether it's the printing press or Facebook ads or whatever, we both have access to the machine. And again, our access is is implicated by the money we can spend, but that's as much true as it is now as it was in 1790. It wasn't exactly poor people who were printing things off printing presses in 1790, particularly given the technology at the time. So, you know, it's as much true now. Money has always facilitated speech, always. And so it's no more problem now than it ever has been. And philosophically, restricting it only hurts the little guy, as far as I can see. I'll read a little bit from the decisions of Citizens United here in the syllabus. Thus, this case cannot be resolved on a narrower ground without chilling political speech, speech that is central to the First Amendment meaning and purpose. Citizens United did not waive this challenge to Austin when it stipulated to the dismissing of the facial challenge below. Even though a challenge could be waived, this court may reconsider Austin. Throughout litigation, Citizens United has asserted the claim the FEC has violated its right to free speech. Because Citizens United narrows grounds are not sustainable, the court must consider the statute facially valid. Then it goes on to say, Austin is overruled and thus provides no basis for allowing the government to limit corporate expenditures. Here, the limit on the expenditures are invalid and cannot be applied to Hillary. In this case, they're referring to Hillary, the movie. The name of the movie was Hillary. So they're not referring to the person, they're referring to the movie. Although the First Amendment provides that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, the campaign finance regulation in Section 441's prohibition on corporate independent expenditures is an outright ban on speech, backed by criminal sanctions. It's a ban notwithstanding the fact that a PAC created by the corporation can still speak, for a PAC is separate association from the corporation. Because speech is the essential mechanism of democracy, going to this fundamental idea of we the people collectively as the republic are in charge of the government, it is the means to hold officials accountable to the people. Political speech must prevail against laws that would suppress it by design or inadvertence. Laws burning such speech are subject to strict, strict scrutiny, which requires the government to prove that its restrictions furthers a compelling interest and is narrowly tailored. Premised on the mistrust of governmental power, the First Amendment stands as an attempt to disfavor subjects or viewpoints or distinguish among different speakers, which may be means of content control. Yeah, the First Amendment has, the First Amendment is designed specifically to protect the speech the government doesn't want protected. That's the entire point. The government has no problem speaking if you favor it. Every government on earth always has. The First Amendment is designed to protect speech against the government. This and court has recognized the First Amendment applies to corporations and extends this protection to the context of political speech in NAACP versus Button. Addresses challenges to the Federal Election Campaign Act, the Buckley Court, we talked about that earlier, Buckley v. Faleo, upheld limits on direct contributions requiring government interests preventing quid pro quo corruption. However, the court, the court invalidated the expenditures ban, which applied to individuals, corporations, and unions, unions because it failed to serve any substantial governmental interest in stemming the reality or appearance of corruption. The First Amendment prohibits Congress from fining or jailing citizens or associations of citizens for engaging in political speech, but the Austin anti-distortion rationale would permit the government to ban political speech because the speaker is in association with a corporate form. Political speech is indispensable to a decision-making in democracy, and this is no less true than it comes from a corporation. That line I really like a lot. Political speech is indispensable to decision-making in a democracy. We need the ability to talk to each other. Now the, court, now the court talks a little bit about how the law favored the rich at the expense of the poor. This goes to what we were talking about philosophically. So let's read what the court said that echoes what I was trying to say. These conclusions were affirmed when the court invalidated a provision that increased the cap on contributions to one candidate if they made it from certain personal funds. Distinguishing wealthy individuals 
from corporations based on the latter special advantages, limited liability does not suffice to allow laws prohibiting speech. It is irrelevant for a First Amendment purpose that corporation funds may have little to no support, political support for the corporation's ideas. All speakers, including individuals and the media, use money amassed from economic marketplace to fund their speech. All speakers use money to facilitate speech. First Amendment protects the resulting speech. Under the anti-distortion rationale, Congress could also ban political speech of media corporations. Although they're currently exempt from the statute, they accumulate wealth with the help of a corporate forum, may have aggregations of wealth, and may express views, having little or no correlation to the public support for those views. Yeah, right. Just because CNN is speaking doesn't mean, and people watch CNN, doesn't mean they support CNN's political views any more than another corporation. Differential treatment of media corporations and other corporations cannot be squared with the First Amendment. There is no support for the view the amendment's original, original meaning would permit suppressing media corporation speech. Austin interferes with the open marketplace of ideas. It is censorship in vast reach, suppressing both the speech of both for-profit and non-profit, both small and large corporations. I, I tell you what, I tell you what, Tactical, I have been thinking about this case for about nine years now. Okay, because that's how long this case has been out. I've been thinking about this for nine years. If someone can tell me why this decision is wrong from basic First Amendment principles, or forget the First Amendment for just a minute, basic freedom of speech principles, the basic, basic political speech principles, if someone can explain to me why this case is wrong, they're smarter than me because I can't figure it out. They say, well, we need to limit money because of the influence. Well, you're just enabling the most entrenched actors because they have the resources to get around it, as we were discussed, discussing in the Canadian situation. They have the resources to publish a book, which isn't really political speech, but of course we know it is. You know, they have the, they have the resources to play those kinds of games. It's the poor person who doesn't have the resources. And they're the ones who are most directly impacted by this. They can't pull their money for their speech. So the rich are just as powerful as they always were, and it's the poor person who is corrupted by this. So even from an egalitarian, equal, equal, even from an equality perspective, from my frame of work for you, this is complete, the idea of restricting speech is completely wrong. From left-leaning values, from left-leaning values of equality, the idea of restricting political speech makes no sense to me. I don't get it. It doesn't make, I don't understand it. I think now that I understand the the arguments i can't think of a way around it i i i i i really think that most people who oppose citizens united don't really understand what the case is about don't understand what was trying to happen they just hear corporations are people and money is speech and they laugh both those views both those summaries are wrong neither one is correct in my view they don't accurately summarize the case and what citizens united was about at its core, in fact, let's find the actual language to, to do some of the, the history about what was going on here. In January 2008, Appellant Citizens United, a nonprofit corporation, released a documentary here and after called Hillary, critical of then Senator Hillary Clinton, a candidate for presidential nomination. Anticipating that it would make Hillary available on cable television through video demand within 30 days of primary elections, Citizens United produced television ads to run on broadcast and cable television. So see what they're trying to do is they were trying to fund political speech that was specifically critical of Hillary Clinton, specifically at the time of the primaries. And this was the speech that was being banned. How does this make sense? Can someone explain this to me? Because it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm not even saying like, it's because it's critical of Hillary. That's not my point. If you think Hillary is the best candidate ever, you should have just as much right to speak as anyone else. The whole point is to allow a speech that I don't necessarily agree with. So support Hillary or don't. Support Donald Trump or don't. I don't care. You should have the right to speak. You should have the right to speak as loud as your voices and your ability and your resources will allow you. And if you hate Donald Trump, you should be able to speak loudly. And Donald Trump should not be able to restrict your money to restrict you from saying so. And when a Democrat someday takes the Oval Office again, they shouldn't have the ability to restrict Republicans' ability to say so. I do not understand the argument that it's a good idea to restrict specifically political speech. I don't get it. People who oppose Citizens United piss me off. 
And this was for a particular period of time. So if they wanted to publish the documentary before the primaries or after, they would have been fine. So oh, yeah. It's just during the primary that they would have been restricted. Yeah. I, I don't... I don't understand. I mean, there have been people who have literally stood up in the Supreme Court and literally, like, said, like, Citizens United should be overruled. I mean, they've, you know, been arrested for it, obviously. But there have been people who have disrupted cases over the last nine years by standing up and just saying, like, Citizens United should be overruled and, you know, give power back to the people and so forth and so on. If, if someone can explain to me, either from First Amendment principles or even from core principles, why it's a good idea to restrict corporate speech and corporate spending, I, I don't understand. I don't get it. I, I try to understand tactical, and this was a 5-4 decision, which just goes to blow my mind. I don't understand how there are four votes for the uh, for the alternative. I don't understand. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. And I've read the dissent, it still doesn't make sense. And I mean, I would hate, like say, um, because this never happened, hypothetically, if I said that a uh, nominee for or a candidate for the presidency had perhaps assaulted me or something like that. If I wanted to speak about my experiences, I would not want the government to turn around and say, actually, you spoke too close to the election times. Your story could have an impact on the election. Therefore, it counts as, you know, you know uh, election spending. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't get it. I, I guess we need people further left than either than than even you, Tactical. We need someone further left to explain this to me. I because consider I, this a very leftist. Viewpoint. I consider it leftist. I consider it a leftist view because it's like if your idea is if your idea is equality, and some people have more money than others, then allow the poor people to pool their money, and allow them to do it that way, so they can speak just as loud as a rich guy. From an equality perspective, it doesn't even make sense to try to restrict people forming corporations for the purpose of supporting or opposing their candidate of choice. And of course, it doesn't have to be on a nationwide level. It could be on a very local level. For your local school board member, the, the principle still applies. So it's like, I don't, I don't understand it. From I don't understand it from a left-leaning perspective. And I certainly don't understand it from a conservative perspective because you know when we interpret the language of the Constitution, we talk about freedom of speech. What is the freedom of speech most intended to protect i mean can there be any argument that the first amendment is most intended to protect political and religious speech those are the two things it's trying to do it talks specifically about freedom of speech talks specifically about petition to redress grievances and talks specifically about the ability of people to assemble three of the five provisions of the first amendment are specifically about political speech and that's specifically what they want to ban, specifically at the time it's most important, by restricting the money expenditure. This is my incredulous face. I was originally planning to try to come up with with interesting jabs or like a, a, a counter position, but I really can't see a way to argue against this that wouldn't end up further disempowering those without power or traditionally without power. Yeah. Because I think one of the one of the things that that I am slightly uncomfortable with is is lobbying and the idea that people, you know, if they donate enough money to a political person, then that person will, you know, advance their interests. So you can donate hundred thousand dollars the nra can donate a hundred thousand dollars to somebody and then that person is less likely to vote for gun right reform and i go but what about the people who can't afford to donate a hundred thousand dollars to well the, the the nra is a really good example of exactly why i what I, what we're talking about because the nra gets its money principally from its members the nra has six million members who are contributing twenty dollars at a time the NRA can only write, you know, the NRA can only do its campaigns and spend $100,000 because, you know, 100,000 people joined. You know, so it's, and the same thing would apply to the ACLU or would apply to Human Rights Watch or would apply to, you know, pick your 
charity or cause of choice. Like, you know, take the cause you most believe in. You know, you could spend the money yourself or you could give $20 to the best, you know, campaign organization and they'll spend money and they'll hire lobbyists to lobby for you. So, you know, the NRA or these other groups, they're lobbying on behalf of their members. So effectively, you and I have bought lobbyists all the time. We buy lobbyists all the time. You know, when we when we contribute to these kinds of organizations that we believe in, one of the many reasons that people who believe in firearms join the NRA is specifically so their money can be pulled so the NRA can speak louder than any of us could individually by pulling the money together. So it's like when the NRA hires a lobbyist, that isn't corruption. That's fulfillment of the six million people who believe in that cause. And when the Brady campaign hires their person, it's exactly the same people who believe in that cause and people who believe in all these causes. It's like, sh shouldn't you be able to draw to, you know, join an organization that believes what you want to believe in through money, be able to speak more powerfully than you ever could. And if that organization makes you unhappy, there's a hundred other organizations who would love to take your money. So you can, through the marketplace of ideas, contribute to the causes you believe in and hire your lobbyists. You've hired lobbyists. You just don't know who they are. Yeah, let's restrict lobbyists. That's a good idea. Let's restrict the ability of people to pull their money together to be able to talk to Congress people. That seems like a real well, genius plan. Well, talking to Congress people is not my problem. Um, it's when um, you're, you're able to donate sort of large amounts of money in order to ensure that this person will do something for you. So you are buying their political position their political favor. Well, I, I, I find that iffy. I, I don't, I, th I think the cause, the causal connection is, is backwards. I don't think it's a lot. I don't think it's that because you gave them money, they support your views. It's more because they support your views. You gave them money. Like if the NRA could buy, you know, say Nancy Pelosi's vote on gun rights issues, they would, but obviously that's not happening. So it's not that it's not that the people that are getting money are representing those views because they're getting money. It's that they're getting the money because they already had those views. The, the NRA and every other group is contributing to candidates who already support their views and are trying to provide them support. I mean, if your local if, if you know, if your next door neighbor ran for office and you like your next door neighbor for in this hypothetical and they need money to buy signs and you give them money so they can buy signs. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. So what does it matter that it's the NRA or the ACLU or anyone else where it's like, I support the, AC, you know, I support the ALC, ACLU because I want them to have money. And I, I want the ACLU to help fund candidates who believe in the same thing as the ACLU. I want them to put money behind so those people can get elected. So, you know, I, I don't think it's that, I don't think the, it's that views are for sale. I think it's that the NRA has made it very clear they're going to spend their money on the candidates they think will support them just as you or I would. And so like they say, well, if you don't do what we want, we won't give you money because you aren't supporting what we want. And our members want certain things and we want to support people who support those certain things. We want to back the candidates who believe what we believe in. If those, if that's not you, that's cool, but we want to find someone else. So to me, that's not corruption. It's not bribery. It's simply saying, you know, you, you, you support us. We want to contribute to you. You don't support us. We don't want to contribute to, to you. I don't see the corruption angle personally. Well, stop making sense. It's not good for my emotions. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Tactical. I think you can get just as emotional the other way around. I, I mean, I can, I, I've been making in large part an emotional case as much as I have factual case. I mean, it's like, don't you want, don't you want the power to speak? Don't you want the power to support candidates who believe what you believe in? Don't you want to give money, for example, to, I don't know, Canadian Human Rights Watch so they can support candidates who believe in human rights so those people can get elected so human rights can be expanded? I mean, don't you want them to have the ability to support candidates who believe what you believe in? Isn't that why you gave them the money in the first place? So they would? I mean, it's like, what's what's the corruption again? Why is this bad? I guess because the the rich and the powerful have so much more to give.
Yeah, but they already did in the first place. And I, I don't, as we've been pointing out, it's like the rich and powerful, where it's not like the, this was stopping the rich and powerful. It never was. It was never stopping the rich and powerful. It was never stopping people who had money because they always had the ability to circumvent. They always have the ability to get around these rules one way or another. They can't do this. They'll do it a hundred other ways. This was only about suppressing people who don't have access. So to me, this is, to me, this principle is, 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 is left leaning as, as you can get. And, you know, it's not just me who says so the ACLU thought this was also correctly decided, you know, as we read from their briefs and there were other organizations on the left. So this wasn't only the people on the right who thought Citizens United was correct. The ACLU thought Citizens United was correct. There were other left leaning organizations that thought Citizens United was correct for all the reasons I've been talking about. I think for me, it's like the core of left leaning principles. It's, it's the most, it's, it helps the poor the most. It helps the most downtrodden the most. And it goes to the core of what the purpose of freedom of speech is at its core. The right of us all to speak to each other so we can convince each other. So we can have the government we want to have, not the government the government wants us to have by restricting the money to prevent us from speaking in a way that would overthrow the government. <laughs> yeah. So let's 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 not give the government the power to decide how we can spend money so that they will not prevent us from spending money in a way that will change who the government is that seems like a bad plan i so, someone someday is going to have to explain to me why any of this was a good idea restricting speech or restricting money i don't understand well yeah well i've certainly learned a lot and uh i came in with a couple misconceptions so i feel very educated i feel like i'm going to be thinking about this and chewing this over for the next couple days and I will probably randomly message you something about it. Be like, I was thinking before I fell asleep. <laughs> well, if you come up with something, let me know because I've been thinking about it for about nine years and I haven't come up with something. I think this is correctly decided and I think everyone who's against it doesn't understand the first damn thing about the case. I don't think they understand the implication of what they're talking about. I particularly don't think that they know that the government thought it would be okay to ban books. I think that they, they might have missed that part of the memo. Yeah. 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 I think I think you've you've got the leftist in me very convinced. Yeah. Well, thank you for watching this video from Uncivil Law. If you enjoyed this video, please follow the link in the description below. Please make sure to subscribe to my channel on Uncivil Law and Facebook.com slash Uncivil Law. And as always, I appreciate your support. Thank you.